So speaking of Tom McKay, it now is a pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker for this morning. I'm sure he's very well known to most of you. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and he certainly has extensive experience in working in psychiatric emergency services for the past quarter century. He was very instrumental in actually setting up the QE2 Psychiatric Emergency Service as well as the short stay unit. And based um, primarily on his extensive clinical experience, his presentation is going to focus on how psychiatric emergencies have evolved over time. Um, as well, in this era of technology, he's actually going to do something innovative he's not using slides for his presentation. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, everyone. And it really is a, an honor. I, uh, I've been here for quite some time, and that means that I've worked quite a bit with Dr. McCormick over the years, and certainly respect him, and I'm honored to be presenting at his memorial uh, academic day. Um, I. I Heather mentioned to me before we started that I was very brave in coming out here without slides and technology. Actually, I'm very cowardly and terrified of getting involved with that sort of stuff. I've, I, I worked my way up to it a decade ago and, and did a couple of PowerPoint presentations and found that I, A, didn't enjoy them, and B, they always went wrong one way or another. So at least this way, when I screw up, I'll be the one that's responsible for it. What I'd like to do is to, to talk a little bit about how the uh, provision of emergency psychiatric services has e evolved, and that's something that I, I know reasonably well. Uh, I, I have been involved with the provision of that service since before there was a, a, a short stay unit and that sort of thing. So it began in the, in the, the good old days with a call from the emergency department to the outpatient psychiatry service and one of us who was on call would uh, go running down to the old infirmary and see the patient and do it a bit of an assessment and make some determination of what we were going to do and where, where we were going to go with that individual patient. Uh, we uh, whined a lot in the uh, uh, the outpatient service. I think the, the doctors who were there with me in those days remember that uh, we used to complain, or at least I did, to, to, to Dr. Tian, who was our program director back then, used to complain a lot about outpatients covering uh, emergency services makes no sense at all. We are all scheduled, and how can we possibly deal with emergencies when we're in an inflexible sort of work environment? It doesn't make sense. It should be inpatients that do it. Well, I guess I shouldn't have complained quite so much because when uh, the, the, the plan for the uh, mental health short stay unit became evolved, uh, it was uh, the third in a series of, of attempts to make, uh, make use of a, a kind of spe uh, specialized uh, urgent care or uh, intensive care for psychiatry. Uh, when the plans became uh, evolved, uh, Dr. Dr. Tian was... Uh, so kind as to offer me the opportunity to help develop the program that, that he had designed, actually. And by the way, since you complain so much about needing inpatients uh, to cover eMERGE, you can do that too. Uh, so the, the two services actually began uh, together at that time. That would have been in 1994. 93, we developed it, 94 it opened. Uh, and uh, I was involved with the program and its early development there. We began to, to develop some of, the, some of the services that have continued to evolve. There was a mobile crisis team that, that evolved to look at people that weren't yet in the hospital. Uh, when we discharged patients from our, our short stay, we began looking at how we could bridge people to community resources and that sort of thing. So the beginnings of an urgent care service uh, were in place uh, at that time in the first few years of the of the short stay uh, of the short stay and uh, psychiatric assessment unit services uh, so that was kind of where we were at the beginning and in general uh, we got involved with the bed management service so that we could move people around and make sure that when beds were required for urgent cases that those beds would be made available the the service uh, continued to evolve, 
and uh, it reached its uh, its current uh, situation uh, oh a good decade ago anyway i i don't think there've been a whole lot of more recent involvements except the the urgent care that i mentioned uh, and the, it became a a fact of seeing the patients that were uh, presenting to the emergency department. So the emergency, psychiatric emergency service, at least initially in those days, was providing support to the emergency department. Initially, it was to try to help to uh, provide information and support to the emergency room docs who were managing the cases. Later on, it evolved that the cases would be managed more by the psychiatric uh, emergency service unit that developed in the emergency department and, and grew as we moved from the old infirmary to the new infirmary and uh, now to the, to the restructured new infirmary. Uh, it's become more and more that the patients are uh, sent to the psychiatric service and they're managed there and beds are found for them if they need beds or they are uh, discharged to services in the community if they, if they don't. There are a number of, of connections. The, the emergency service itself consists of the, the psychiatric emergency service. It's connected to the short stay unit. That's connected to, as well, the urgent care service and the mobile crisis team. These are all part of the, the, uh, the crisis portfolio that, that uh, we use to uh, intervene and make crisis interventions uh, as required in the community. There are also a number of, of uh, connections to the psychiatric services in the community at large. So the psychiatric emergency services very often will be referring patients to acute care in the community or possibly in hospital. Uh, often to uh, some of the, of the more specialized structures like uh, the uh, recovery and integration services for, for those patients that require that kind of support uh, in the community and the, the specialized uh, areas that provide acute care treatment for seniors and for adolescents. The, the requirements to, to work in the uh, psychiatric emergency service are that, you, that you're aware of everything that's going on in the whole system. So there has to be a, a kind of global view so you know how to kind of move people in and out of the various places that they need to, to go to and you, you need to be aware of the restrictions that, that are uh, in existence, both in the inpatient services and in the community. Uh, we've also evolved a way of trying to lighten the load of the emergency department, and over, over time, I think that's become the, the main driving force for psychiatric emergency services, is to help the emergency departments to maintain their flow through of cases so that they can continue to work in all the ways that they have to. Uh, so that has evolved to, in fact, taking some patients directly from uh, community doctors. Uh, the family doctors in the community have access uh, uh, when they know about it and when they very often it's people that have graduated from our program that use it that they can connect with psychiatric emergency services directly if they have an emergency that would require that kind of uh, that kind of support uh, that that leads a little bit to some of my my thoughts about how and why we've kind of evolved the way that, that we have I, I don't think it's a, an accident or a coincidence that around 91 or 92, uh, a, 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 uh, an earth-shattering program uh, change occurred in medicine. And where prior to that time, 100% of medical graduates approximately, I mean, there were some exceptions, but the, 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 the overwhelming majority of, of medical school graduates were, were qualified family docs when they got out of medical school and they all went and practiced and there were family docs that were established and sometimes they would get into a practice that they enjoyed and would remain there. And the, the old, older style of, of family medicine was, was very strong. Since the, the change to uh, a, a, a teaching family medicine so that 
they are about 15% of the of the graduating classes of medicine. There's been a, a distinct drop in the in the numbers and availability of family doctors. You can you can notice it when you come. I, I went away from Calgary, or I went away to Calgary in in uh, 2000 or, or 1999, and came back in 2009 and found it was tremendously difficult to get a family doctor. I had one when I left, but finding a new one when I get back was a challenge for me. And if it's a challenge for me, I can imagine what, what people that are coming in that don't know that much about the system would find. So the, the, the kind of consistent care and support that was governed by family doctors in the community seems to be, uh, be eroding somewhat. And uh, I think much of what we're doing is getting specialists kind of to pick up the different parts of the different patients as they, as they require them. And that includes psychiatry, but it, it also includes the fact that if you're a, a surgeon or, or an internist, a cardiologist, and you've got a patient and you're concerned about their, their mental health, you no longer have the, the, the luxury of telling them to go back to their family doctor and have him kind of sort it out, because many of them don't have family doctors now. And, and, and when they do, it's sometimes very hard to, to get in to see your family doctor. So I, I think that that has a lot to do with how and why we've had to uh, try to create a system that's kind of making up for that bit of a loss. So. That's my thoughts on that subject, and I know that I'm way ahead of schedule, so uh, the, the, are there any questions at all from anybody about our system or how it might work? Well, thank you very much, Dr. McKay. Um, for questions, we do have two microphones, one on either side, so if you do have a question for Dr. McKay, if you'd like to just go up to those microphones, or if you have any comments to uh, make, that would be appreciated. How about if I ask a question? Does anybody have any? Does anybody have any thoughts about how the provision of care? And ma many of you here are here. I, I recognize half of you anyway, so I know that most of you actually work in the system. And and I wonder whether anybody has any thoughts about how how the system might be uh, improved. I mean, other than kind of you know sort of suddenly creating a budget for another twenty or thirty psychiatrists and another hundred psychiatric nurses and stuff like that. Uh, but are there any, you know, design things? Because I, I really think we're, we're reaching a, a point where we're going to need to make some kind of a, some kind of a new start at, at accomplishing things. Anyway, if there are any thoughts, please. I've had long interest in uh, provision of emergency services, and uh, I think about uh, 30 years ago or so, I developed a plan in Kingston to uh, have a dedicated team, which was actually not funded by the Ministry of Health. I did all this work, interviewed everybody, police, et cetera, et cetera. So I've had a long interest in this area, and um, when I first came here as a head, the residents were very, very unhappy with the... Uh, with the situation in the emergency department, and um, I think I got more heat from the residents uh, on that issue than anything else. So over the last uh, few years, there's been a huge uh, change, really, in, in the way that our, our emergency service, uh, service works. And uh, this includes um, dedicated psychiatric nursing staff, right? And I just wonder, I mean, apart from the facilities that we have, Dr. McKay, um, who uh, has uh, done so much to lead things. Um, the dedicated nursing team, 24-7, in the QE2, you know, one place instead of two eMERGE services in, in this uh, municipality has been, made a huge difference, I think. So, so the, the, there has been a huge quality improvement in, in the way the, that our system works. And I just want to mention that. I don't know if Debbie has some things to add there, because I think it, it took quite a while to, to get the... Uh, the, 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 the staff with, uh, with uh, you know, vocation, with the skills, with the interest, and it really works well, and we're most appreciative of it. And the residents, I think, are nearly always very happy, except for when the nurses aren't there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I can probably add a lot to that, but I'll try to limit it. Um, when we first began the service um, 21 years ago, 
I think the big difference between now, or then and now, and Bob, you'll remember, we had two sites. Um, there was the, um, the Halifax side and the Dartmouth side. So people would be juggled and shuffled back and forth across the harbor for medical assessment. Um, it, then it would depend on, sometimes on what side of a street the person lived on would be. Um, would determine where they would seek admission. So that I think is a huge benefit and that comes from having one dedicated, um, one dedicated emergency service to provide care for everybody in our district. Um, and even in the beginning when we kind of, you know, dissolved those boundaries and had one district, um, there was the time that the nurse would leave at 9 o'clock at night, so the, the care would be transferred back to the emergency um, department nurses. And uh, the care changed at that time. Um, it became very custodial. Um, people would be, you know, eyeballed at night, and that's what emergency nurse, nurses are, feel they're capable to provide for people seeking um, treatment for mental illness. So now with the nurses, and I see many of them sitting over here in the corner, um, that expert care not only is provided from nine o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night, but it's provided throughout the night. And um, yes, that's it, it, just to um, echo what, what Nick has said, um, it, has it has enabled the service to provide 24 hour, around the clock, uh, 365 days a year expert um, psychiatric nursing care to patients. We, we are very um, committed to having expert nurses um, provide that care. So yeah, unfortunately for some of the residents, it does mean that the residents are, are without the support of the nursing staff through the night. Um, however, if we think back to um, um, when the service began, there were no psychiatric nurses from nine o'clock at night on. Um, so now there are gaps but um, they are gaps and when, you know, now it's a few nights every now and then as opposed to every night of every week. So, anyway. Thanks. Hi, I'm Stephen Ayer with the Schizophrenia Society. Thank you for the uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I do have personal experience uh, going back to 1989 where I was uh, taken to the VG emergency and from there I was put in a patient transfer van, which I remember very, very clearly, and taken over to um, the Nova Scotia Hospital where I was admitted. Um, I, I am so grateful for, for, for that. Uh, and, and then um, subsequent to that in 1995, had another experience and at that time I, could, I actually walked into the Nova Scotia Hospital um, and asked for some help on two occasions and, and uh, people were extremely helpful at that time as well. So I have nothing but good things to say about the staff and, and the services that I received. My question is relating more to today, which I don't have direct experience with, thank goodness, because of the care that I've received <laughs> and I've been able to uh, make a, a good recovery. Um, yes, we have great I understand great services. One of my main questions, though, is my understand, trying to get an understanding of when a person goes to the emergency at the QE2, whether or not um, they, they get what I consider to be a parallel service where they'll get a medical clearance type assessment and a psychiatric assessment at the same time, whereas they don't have to wait for one, like the medical clearance, to happen before the psychiatric assessment so that does that happen simultaneously uh, I, I guess the brief way of answering that is yes it is available Sometimes. but uh, it doesn't happen that often because very many of the uh, patients th that that present to the emergency department that ultimately come to psychiatry are medically uh, impaired to the extent that they're they're not available for psychiatric assessment on arrival. Uh, when patients are presenting with with mental health concerns and there's uh, there is no uh, evidence and no history of significant medical problems, we have it in place that that can occur. 
Uh, it, like I said, it doesn't happen all that often because of the fact that very often patients are uh, uh, impaired in one way or another when they when they come in. Um, impaired medical, yeah. There's medical concern that that there there is a, a problem that needs to be uh, stabilized somewhat before a, a, a useful psychiatric assessment can be done. Debbie has some. Yeah. Traditionally, the way things happened was was strictly a, in a consultative operated in a consultative model. So someone arrived in the emergency department. They saw. Um, they were triaged, saw an eMERGE nurse, saw an eMERGE physician, and then at that point it would be determined whether psychiatry would be involved or not. Um, so what we have done over the last few years is created what's called a parallel process so that if someone comes to the emergency department and there is a psychiatric nurse available, um, the emergency nurse, or even, you know, the nurses are so keen, sometimes mm -hmm. they'll go finding people that they believe will, will benefit from their intervention. So now what can happen is the, the um, both assessments are very important, but now we've decided that it sometimes it's better that the psychiatric um, assessment and intervention happens before the medical intervention. However, one thing we are very clear about is that um, everybody that walks through that door um, requires and, and is, um, is entitled to a thorough, comprehensive um, medical assessment because what we don't want to do is set up a process so that somebody, just because they've had a mental illness in their life, um, just because they're presenting with my, what might look like a mental illness, that we don't miss something that's, um, that's either neurological or driven by an endocrine disorder, that actually if, if it's missed and not treated appropriately, that that person could have a very serious outcome. So that's something we're very strict about. Um, we, we don't just take people as a, you know, a walk-in service and say, okay, n now they're ours, you can just back off. We want to make sure that people get all of the care that they require. I might add that that closest to a walk-in service that we might have would be people who have a good relationship and rapport with their family doctor. I mentioned it earlier that the family doctors can access the psychiatric emergency service directly by simply making sure that the medical, the, the complete medical evaluation is done. Yeah. Thanks, Tom, for the presentation. I can remember in the bad old days in my residency in the 80s, we had the same complaints as residents more recently, not currently maybe, but uh, there's been a huge evolution. Um, I have a suggestion and a request. As a community psychiatrist, um, I find that when there are changes, uh, when services are enhanced or changed, I don't hear about it. And I can imagine that um, community, <coughs> excuse me, physicians, family physicians also are in the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the same situation. So the worst time to learn about what new services or changes there are is when there's a, an emergency, and that seems to me the only time that I kind of uh, find out. So I don't know what has been done, but I would suggest that that would be very helpful and we could utilize the services better if we knew exactly when there were changes, who to contact, and um, just sort of a step-by-step. -step. And whether that's through an email out to all CDHA physicians or whether that's through Doctors Nova Scotia through their uh, little booklet they uh, put out every month or so. Thank you. Th that's a that's a good uh, uh, a good thought uh, because it's been mainly in places like this that these things have uh, been uh, picked up by the general public. I think so. Uh, uh, perhaps accessing uh, Doctors Nova Scotia and maybe doing some sort of uh, information column or something. Yeah. Thanks. My my name's Kurt Peters. Uh, Tom, I have uh, two questions. We have time for both. Uh, the first one is um, uh, having done uh, residency here and then staff and seen some of the evolution and development of, uh, of our crisis services, uh, which includes uh, so many different factors uh, from staff, um, just the, 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 the facility itself and how it's built. Um, union issues, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite complex. 
I've, I've, I've seen some of the emergency services in different places across the country just as a result mostly of uh, when I was a medical student and traveling around. But I guess given your experience and expertise, if you were to put on sort of your glasses that look into the future and how things evolve given the circumstances that exist here now in Halifax, how would you see things ideally moving forward uh, in our uh, crisis service along that whole continuum of mobile crisis, the psych assessment, urgent care, and the short stay unit? Wow. Uh, I, ideally, uh, I, I, I guess uh, I, I would I, I would see the, the the establishment of, of uh, permanent and and uh, devoted uh, services to dealing with psychiatric uh, uh, emergencies. So bolstering the the filling the gaps that Debbie already spoke of, and making sure that there is always a, a staff psychiatrist that's available not only not only for for supervising the the clinical work, but also to make sure that residents are getting a good experience in their learning. Uh, when they when they do do their emergency their emergency part, uh, I, I I think we might uh, benefit from uh, uh, increasing the communication between different components of of the of the system as it now as it now stands. Although we're we're trying we're trying very hard to to make sure that we maintain, for instance, uh, sometimes a. Uh, uh, a, a mobile crisis team may have a patient that doesn't really need admission but is unable to to access their regular prescription for one reason or another that they will get a hold of the emergency room doc psychiatrist and and, and have that looked at uh, outside of the emergency department urgent care certainly does that from time to time so but increasing that that communication within the within the whole program I think would be helpful would be useful uh, I, I think with our population growth and stuff that we probably could use a, a couple more uh, short stay beds, uh, but uh, that would be that would be nice. The the fantasy that most of us that, that work in in that area, particularly the short stay area, is to to be strong, a bit more strongly connected to the the psych emergency service. So that might be helpful too. So my first question was kind of looking forward, and my next question is sort of for my education in terms of looking backwards a bit about the short stay unit model and how that looks here or may look elsewhere. I wonder if you could speak to how it came about and maybe some of the rationale about the, the way, uh, how it exists. I, 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 c I can talk a, a bit going backwards. There, there, were, there were a few, very few, uh, written reports of short stay units uh, certainly in Canada there were none I think and there were very few in the United States when we when we first developed the program to the best of my knowledge it it came from from the 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 cranium of uh, uh, Mike Tien and Mary Potier who were the, the the program leaders back in back in the early 90s and uh, they suggested as we went on and worked it through and as we developed it it, it began it, it became kind of a psych emerge program with the, if you needed a couple more days and there'd be the short stay and if you needed uh, somebody to make sure that you got to outpatient psychiatry became urgent you know so that kind of evolved over time uh, but the original notion of let's let's have an admission for people that when we admit them we think that with a high level of social work input we can get them reconnected with the community within three days that was the admission criteria not the discharge uh, criteria so it's not you've been here 72 hours out you go it's it's rather when it's appropriate for you to be discharged you go that that, that kind of that kind of all evolved over time and I, I don't think there's any single uh, event that occurred at at least not in my memory, Debbie. No. Her? Tom, thank you very much for your historical perspective and explaining your system of care in the adult system. Since we have a bit of time, I'll add a, the child and adolescent dimension uh, and make some comments. We came from a non-system of care when we had three different service deliveries. The Nova Scotia Hospital with children and adolescents who provided acute admissions, but no other child and adolescent emergency services an outpatient clinic called the Atlantic Child Guidance Clinic that provided only outpatient services but no emergency services. 
and the IWK Health Center who provided emergency services. As we amalgamated, it became clear that it was a joint responsibility to look after them. Then we w w veered off into Never Neverland. We thought that we would try and uh, create sectoral responsibility so that uh, one clinic that uh, serviced the Dartmouth and related area out into the county would have its own emergency services and that people would be responsible for everything. They would provide inpatient services, outpatient services, and emergency services for their population. Same for the Halifax sector and same for the uh, Sackville kind of sector. That was a disaster. Uh, <laughs> we could not uh, uh, fulfill that. It was a total waste of time of having people on standby who were clinicians ordinarily for outpatient services and so on to uh, make themselves available for that. So then we moved into centralizing it back to the IWK Health Center. Our biggest advance has been similar to yours, that we've uh, developed a crisis team, uh, and that's been a, an, a tremendous boon to our services, to have qualified crisis workers, uh, and then subsequently, more recently, an urgent care clinic similar to yours. We don't really have uh, a short stay unit in that sense. We would like to have one, but uh, don't have one. Uh, however, as you probably know, we have um, problems because of our tertiary care nature of child and adolescent health, mental health being um, centralized into Halifax. So mm -hmm. our emergency services are for the province. Yeah. And so we get referrals from around the province. And sometimes it has to do by the hours. So if there are crisis workers available in another clinic until 3 p.m., so they start to quit work at about 2 p.m., not taking any more cases, we get the cases mm -hmm. after hours. We have an upload. Which is, which is very difficult for a staff who work daytime, particularly psychiatrists and residents, to then deal with a large patient load who come in from around the province later in the day. We have the other situation where, as you know, that we provide uh, mental health services for young people up to their 19th birthday, uh, but the IWK Health Center provides medical services only up to the 16th birthday. So they end up in the Halifax Infirmary with an overdose to get treated for the overdose medically and then transferred to the IWK. It's the only age group, adolescent age groups, who have their services divided like that. So we have a long way to go to somehow really improve yeah. the care of particularly adolescents uh, in regard to the emergencies, which are occurring at a very high rate. And another thing that's happened to us, and I want to ask you that question, is our system, because of wait lists, our emergency system, has become a favorite intake to get people into mental health services. So when people are waiting on waiting lists uh, or don't know how to access the system, they arrive in the emergency department in order to get services to get into our system. And so we're seeing cases over and over again who should not come to an emergency department to be seen. It's being used as an entry point into mental health services. Any comments? Uh, I have a, a couple of comments that came to me, and I'll see how many of them I can remember. Uh, it, it's uh, just to add to that, from the point of view of education, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, do some work with the uh, the residents while, during their time in the uh, in the IWK uh, to look at working on some of their emergency experiences in in a sort of debrief rounds that we do. Uh, so we we are joined by. Uh, psychiatrists that will talk to the resident questions and issues around their experience. Uh, the the the, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about the issue of of adolescence and where they fit in. Um, I, I I abhor the notion that if you're 18 years and uh, you know 364 days old, you go there, and if you're if you're a day older, you come here. Uh, and people will access, you can access community resources uh, if they're at that point, but before that, no, they all have to go down there. That's, that's terrible. Uh, it really should be more rel relevant to the actual individual patient rather than to, to the, the, the day they were born. So that, that's, that's an, been an ongoing problem for me uh, ever since. I, I, I speak from time to time uh, too much. I, 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 trying not to whine about too many things. The last time I whined, I wound up with a career change. So I, I, think, I think maybe at this point I won't whine too much about it, but I do comment on the fact that it would be much more relevant for a 17-year-old living in a common law relationship with a one-year-old baby and working in a factory to be seen in the adult system. It just doesn't make any sense to me. 
morning. Um, I'm just curious, with Nova Scotia's changing demographic as they get older, uh, the aging and the mental health needs of um, emergent needs of our seniors' mental health services. And I'm curious um, how the emergency mental health system is going to look at responding to the urgent or emergent needs of the senior population and how we can, how the system or the psychiatric system plans to support that given that seniors' mental health is the resourcing of that, to my knowledge, is not as rich or could be richer. So I'm just curious how the seniors' mental health urgent needs are going to be vetted forward. Uh, unfortunately, I think the answer to that is well, way too easy. They'll be treated like everybody else that that kind of comes in in so far as the emergency service goes. So to my knowledge, seniors mental health is a kind of tertiary care program, so it's not a, a direct emergency access uh, sort of uh, uh, program. So we will see any age group as long as they're 19 years or, yeah. So, uh, before we change that one. Uh, so we will see uh, people aged 19 and above with no top limit that are presenting to the emergency department or, like I said before, to their family doctor or any other medical uh, uh, practitioner uh, will be seen and assessed and will will make our best shot at giving them appropriate resources. If there's life-saving interventions that need to be made, if there's uh, custodial matters that are at issue, if there are, and these are all things that do come up with, with seniors, then, then we'll, we'll see what we can do with those. But we cannot uh, just simply get people into seniors. We refer them the same as everybody else does. Hi, Hi. thank you. Uh, my name is Teresa Vino. I'm a psychiatrist in uh, rural Nova Scotia. I've been practicing 10 years, and I, I really thank you for this topic. I think it's so relevant uh, currently, and I know in the northern zone, uh, we're in the process of trying to improve acute uh, psychiatric services. And so, of course, um, short-stay units, crisis beds, observation beds, the language is different depending on the, the uh, article that you read, which is a bit confusing for me. Um, and uh, Dr. Ian Daw calls them observation beds. He has a position paper in the CPA um, outlining the importance of observation beds in our emergency departments. And for me, practicing rurally, I think it's so important that we have um, psychiatric emergency services in our ERs. But uh, it's a very hard process to establish these uh, services. And uh, I just wonder uh, if you have thoughts on, in terms of population base, um, you know, how many beds uh, one would need in, uh, in their emergency uh, department in terms of an observation bed. Um, and uh, how to facilitate uh, the development of these processes. And I guess another point uh, that I think is relevant is um, how do we ensure consistency across uh, our province in terms of the provision of psychiatric services? Okay. Uh <laughs> I'm, I'm a clinician, so I, I don't know how much of the issues that deal with resourcing I can, I can answer directly. I can tell you that I understand the confusion around all of the questions and issues about emergency psychiatry, because actually in a recent article, the, 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 uh, uh, the author, and I can't recall who it was, indicated that really it varies widely from place to place depending on the nature of the services available stably in the community. So the question is, you have to make up for what you don't have in the emergency department. And no matter which emergency department you're in, it'll, it'll vary with what you have to make up for. So it's hard to give that as a, as a, a gross general answer. We, we don't have formal observation beds at all in, in our system. Uh, we, we will admit patients occasionally when there are no beds in, in, uh, on the psychiatric inpatient units. We will admit patients to, to virtual beds in the emergency department. I think what, what most people call observation beds would be what we call the short stay unit, where, where people actually have an extended emergency stay, but it's, it's off, it's nowhere near, it's in the Abbey Lane, it's nowhere near the emergency department, unfortunately, I think, but that, that's the case. But, so we therefore don't have they're treated as in inpatient beds. 